The Appalachia of the Fallout universe is, and was, home to some amazing people, but also some terrible people. I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is my list of the 10 most evil people in Appalachia. A quick disclaimer, this video was made in late November to early December 2022. It covers individuals in Appalachia between 2077 and 2104. So if it's 2025 and all 10 have been supplanted by people who are even more evil, know that this was my view at this time. That said, let's get into it. At number 10, we have Lewis, the Poisoner of Morgantown. In the years before the bombs, Lewis was a chemistry major at vault -Tec University, a member of the Eta Psi Epsilon Tau Honors Fraternity, and a self-proclaimed Nuka-Cola aficionado. In order to show his love for his preferred brand of soda, he had accumulated a vast quantity of Nuka-Cola merchandise, a collection that was growing too large for his dorm room. He decided that he would have to procure more space if he was going to continue to grow his collection. A warehouse would do the trick. He didn't have the financial resources required to do this, but he had a plan. He would generate the funds required by formulating and selling a Nuka-Cola-based alcoholic beverage to his classmates. Once created, the beverage became known as Nuka-Shine, and his fellow frat members built an entire distillery and speakeasy in order to produce and sell it. What the public didn't know was that Lewis had used family connections to obtain a Robobrain robot to serve as a drink tester. The idea that some unknown person had their mind taken from them to serve as the CPU for a drink tester is horrific. Even worse, Lewis had formulated Nukashine with nuclear waste to give it that extra kick. Lewis was knowingly poisoning his unaware customers so that he could obtain funds to rent a warehouse to store his soda merch. While Lewis's actions would likely have led to cancerous deaths for his customers, the next individual on this list killed his victims much more quickly. That individual at number 9 on the list is Harland Elliott, the malevolent dean of VTU. Before the bombs, the staff members that would one day operate the vault Tech vaults across the country were trained at vault Tech University in Morgantown, West Virginia. This includes the vault overseers that would be responsible for administering the staff and population of those vaults. Behind the scenes, those overseers would also be running the experiments that vault Tech would perform on the confined populations of those vaults. Before the overseer candidates could be approved to run a vault of their own, they had to run a simulated vault experiment in VTU's test vault, and Dean Elliott would decide if the experiment was good enough to warrant a simulation. The last simulated experiment to be run in this test vault was the brainchild of overseer candidate Drew Collingsworth. For his simulated experiment, Drew had formulated a nutritious paste that he believed could be stored more easily than standard vault fare. If successful, it would mean that the vaults would be able to store more food in their existing storage space. Though the paste could be flavored to dweller requests, it would remain the same texture regardless of the chosen flavor. Drew's primary concern was if a population could stomach eating food with the same texture day in and out. A control group would be fed normal vault food, while an experimental group would be fed his nutritious paste. Dean Elliott approved the experiment, but he was planning an experiment of his own. On October 16th, 2077, the experimental dwellers descended into the test vault and the experiment began. For the next week, the day-to-day -day operations of the vault were only interrupted by a temporary power failure on the 23rd, which was quickly rectified by the test group. Three days later, a maintenance worker dropped dead without warning. An autopsy revealed that their heart was hard and cracked. Follow-up examinations showed that the experimental group that was consuming Drew's nutritional paste had their own arterial blockages. It turns out that Dean Elliott had added an arterial placking agent to the paste. He had hoped to study the effects of food-induced death in the vault, expecting a full-on revolt within three weeks. Drew tried to call the experiment off, but received no response from the outside. What he hadn't known at the time was that the power outage on the 23rd had just been a side effect of the nuclear war being initiated. Dean Elliott not only ran an experiment on these unsuspecting VTU students that he knew would be lethal, but he abandoned them in the test vault to die of starvation or heart attack. Though the Dean's terminal seems to indicate that Drew was in on the experiment, Drew's own logs show nothing but surprise and confusion. I have no doubt that this wasn't an isolated event, and one has to wonder how many were slain in Dean Elliott's experiments. The next man on this list wasn't planning on killing his victims with food, but turning them into it. At number 8 we have Morris Stevens, the chief cannibal of the Gormons Raider Gang. 
In the aftermath of the bombs, the early season skiers at the Pleasant Valley Ski Resort found themselves stranded hundreds or even thousands of miles from home. The resorts were already low on supplies when nuclear winter swept in weeks later. Over the winter of 2077 to 2078, the resort goers had to resort to previously unimaginable acts in order to survive, including cannibalism. While most of these former holiday makers gave up eating their fellow man when the snows thawed, Morris and his wife Edie were among those who found they had a taste for it. These cannibals by choice collectively became known as the Gourmands, and Morris became their leader. One of the cardinal rules of their organization was that they didn't eat their fellow cannibals. This was a rule that Morris couldn't stick to. This fact was divined when one of the Gourmands went missing and was found half-eaten in Morris and Edie's room. Banished from the Gourmands, Morris and Edie retreated into a local cave where they hunted travelers on the highway. Over time, Morris's hunger grew until he devoured his own wife and became the Wendigo of Wendigo Cave. While Morris Stevens became a monster in the literal, the next individual on this list was a monster in the figurative. At number seven, we have Olivia Rivers, the betrayer of the Mistresses of Mystery. Olivia was the daughter of Shannon Rivers, the voice actress of the comic book hero, The Mistress of Mystery. Her mother's busy schedule meant that she didn't spend much time with Olivia over the years. The only thing that held their relationship together was a yearly camping trip to Seneca Rocks. In June 2077, Shannon canceled the yearly October outing with her daughter to go to Boston to audition to play The Mistress of Mystery on television. Shannon had spent months training for the job, working long hours with multiple experts to turn herself into the Mistress of Mystery. Luckily for Shannon, she was replaced with a younger actor for the television role, meaning she was home with her family when the bombs came down. In the summer of 2078, an altercation with a party of bandits showed that Shannon's training hadn't just been for show. To Olivia's shock and acclaim, Shannon beat these bandits to death or into unconsciousness without issue. Over the next four years, Shannon trained Olivia as she had been trained, turning her daughter into a killing machine. The two unfortunately began to drift apart again when the family took on several orphaned girls who Shannon also trained. In December 2082, when the Raiders of Appalachia became too big a threat to ignore, Shannon declared war on them. Over the next few years, Shannon, Olivia, and the adopted Mistresses of Mystery waged a campaign of death and destruction against the Raiders. Their record in this conflict was flawless until one of the adopted Mistresses was slain in February of 2086. Her death hit Olivia particularly hard. Olivia had spent three years killing Raiders for her mother, but they just kept coming. Olivia had begun to view their cause as impossible, and now she had lost a friend to it. Three months later, Shannon appointed a different mistress to a leadership role Olivia coveted. While Shannon was attempting to avoid the appearance of nepotism, Olivia saw it as her mother once again favoring anyone but herself. Not long after this, Olivia began to work with the raiders she'd once hunted. She struck a deal. She would feed the raiders information on her sister mistresses, and in return, she would gain a place of prominence in their organization. Over the summer of 2086, the raiders used Olivia's information to pick her sisters off one at a time. When an ambush failed and a mistress was about to wipe the raiders out, Olivia killed her to save her contract with the raiders. In November of 2086, while Shannon was away, Olivia's treason was discovered. Unfortunately, Olivia saw this taking place, and she killed every mistress in the sanctum. She set fire to the house and left a note in the ruined sanctum for her mother, inviting her to the camping trip she had canceled nine years prior. When Shannon arrived at their traditional campsite, she and Olivia battled to the death. When Olivia emerged victorious, she was slain by the raiders. They had never intended to take a traitor into their ranks, much less one that would kill her own mother for power. While self-interest turned Olivia Rivers into one of the most egregious traitors in the Fallout universe, the self-interest of this next man was responsible for many of the societal ills of pre-war Appalachia. Number six is Robert Baron Daniel Hornwright, the head of Hornwright Industrial, the Mining and Robotics Corporation. The crimes of Daniel Hornwright are many and diverse in their targets, but they were all in service of improving the circumstances of himself, his family, and his company. When Hornwright was approached by an environmental group looking to clear the pollution out of the air of Appalachia using a proprietary air purifier, Daniel saw a different use to their technology. The purifiers pulled contaminants out of the air and concentrated them, effectively mining the air. He reasoned that rather than sending his miners into the ground, he could just set his mines on fire and mine the air. Hornwright Industrial repurposed the environmentalist tech, renaming them Ash Forges, and used them as an excuse to make the air even dirtier. Hornwright Industrial created the Autumn Miner, a specialized mining robot that was wiping out the jobs of human miners across Appalachia. While this was not a crime, Hornwright's efforts against their competition were. 
A rival mining company, Garahan Mining, attempted to engineer a specialized suit of power armor that would give human miners a fighting chance against the auto miner. To showcase their efforts, CEO Vivian Garahan called for the Man vs. Machine event, a competition that would pit a mining crew outfitted with their new excavator power armor against Hornwright Industrial's auto miners. Hornwright Industrial spied on and then sabotaged their efforts, leading to the victory of the auto miners. This was a nail in the coffin of Garahan Mining and for the jobs of human miners across the region. With the success of the auto miners, Daniel saw a big future in automation. He pushed for the Appalachian Prosperity Act, an initiative to replace all government workers with robots. And then he lobbied the governor to let Hornrut Industrial make those robots. Again, this by itself wasn't criminal. But when Senator Sam Blackwell began to speak out against the APA, Daniel Hornrut ordered his fixer to scare the senator out of the limelight. His fixer threatened Senator Blackwell's daughter's life, sufficiently terrifying the senator into taking his daughter home from VTU and running to his secret bunker. Lastly, when Hornrut Industrial's own human strike breakers refused to violently remove protesters from his mines, Daniel Hornrut collaborated with Robco to produce robotic strike breakers. These robots wouldn't just bash a striker with a cudgel, they'd shoot them if it meant removing them from Hornrut's property. While Daniel Hornrut did evil to enrich himself, the next man on this list was absolutely selfless in his evil. The sinister scientist Dr. Edgar Blackburn, number five on my list, epitomizes the old cliche that the road to hell is paved in good intentions. Before the war, Dr. Edgar Blackburn was a university professor and researcher working towards tenure. Seeing that the pre-war world was heading towards ruin shook Dr. Blackburn from his self-interest. He wanted to do anything he could to save as many people as possible. One of the greatest issues facing humanity at the time was food shortages, and this is where he believed he could make the biggest difference. The defense contractor Westech was working on something new, the Pan Immunity Variant Project or PVP. While the PVP was mostly directed towards the purpose of bioengineering a vaccination against all disease, there was a second objective that was being explored under the name the Greenhouse Initiative. Located in Huntersville, West Virginia, this project was planning to use the PVP to genetically engineer food crops that would feed the hungry public. Dr. Blackburn was hired on as a research scientist for the Greenhouse Initiative just prior to the project's cancellation. It turned out that in testing, the PVP had been causing test subjects to develop increased strength, intelligence, and immunity to radiation. The Pan Immunity Variant was renamed the Forced Evolutionary Virus, and the project was redirected towards the creation of super soldiers. The project director of the now defunct Greenhouse Initiative convinced Dr. Blackburn to stay a part of the FEV project, a decision he would come to regret as he watched his superiors mutate the FEV and use it to create inhuman monsters like the Snallygaster and Grafton Monster. When the bombs came down, Dr. Blackburn left Appalachia and wandered the wasteland. Everywhere he went, he saw people suffering. Horrible new diseases had been created in the radioactive wastes, diseases without cure or even treatment. He saw wastelanders create folk remedies of varying efficacy and lamented his inability to help them. In the back of his mind, an answer to their problems began to form. He would restart the Pan Immunity Variant Project and steer it towards its original purpose. In 2103, 26 years after he fled his old life, Dr. Blackburn returned to Appalachia. The equipment in his old lab at West Tech Huntersville was not in any shape to edit the virus, not to mention that the lab itself was overrun with super mutants. He heard that a high-tech organization called the Brotherhood of Steel had arrived in the area, and he went to ask them for equipment. When he found himself surrounded by petitioners with more base-level needs, he knew he would have to look elsewhere. He finally found the perfect spot in Vault 96, the abandoned vault had all the DNA editing equipment he could ask for, cages for test specimens, and robotic security to safeguard his work. Dr. Blackburn knew he would need help distributing his corrected FEV, so he contacted some of his old colleagues and got them to join his efforts. While West Tech Huntersville wasn't right for reworking the virus, the basement held an FEV production center capable of mass producing his corrected strain once completed. He left his colleagues to prepare the equipment for production and went about his own work. He knew that he would need human test subjects, but that no one would volunteer if properly informed about what they were getting themselves into. He decided on a different approach. He would kidnap his specimens. Over the course of the next year, he kidnapped test subjects one by one. Many were wastelanders just looking for help with their medical conditions that voluntarily followed the PhD they assumed was an MD. When this proved insufficient for his needs, he hired the Hellcat Mercenary Company to kidnap subjects for him. Within the labs of Vault 96, Dr. Blackburn would infect a test subject with a strain of FEV, 
run tests on their immunity, and dump them out of the vault if they began to change into super mutants. He would then refine the strain and start over. From 2103 to 2104, he produced hundreds of super mutants with increasing levels of intelligence, along with piles of corpses of subjects that didn't survive the testing. The super mutants he created ranged out across Appalachia, attacking settlements. When members of the Brotherhood of Steel discovered the source of these super mutants, they captured Dr. Blackburn. Under interrogation, he revealed that he had completed his work and that his colleagues were preparing to distribute the corrected strain across Appalachia. In attempting to halt this distribution, the Brotherhood brought Dr. Blackburn to West Tech. Once on site, he lied his way out of the Brotherhood's control and dosed himself with the FEV. He assumed it would prove him right and get the Brotherhood to stop their objections to his work. He was wrong. The FEV wasn't ready yet, and he was converted into a super mutant behemoth. Had his strain been distributed over Appalachia, hundreds or even thousands may have died or been converted. Despite the horror surrounding Dr. Blackburn's actions, he never did what he did with ill will. He hated himself for what he did to the involuntary test subjects and knew that he would be cursed for the wrong he did. He simply believed that in sacrificing hundreds, he would save thousands or even millions of wastelanders from radiation, illness, and death. For Dr. Blackburn, Machiavelli was right. The end would justify the means. While Dr. Blackburn did evil while trying to do good, the next two on our list were trying to hurt people. Numbers 4 and 3 are Arthur Wood and Darius Angler, creators of the Toxic Valley. In the run-up to the bombs, the Grafton Steel Mill was one of Appalachia's greatest contributions to the American war effort against the Red Chinese Menace. Day and night, workers churned out tons of steel used in the manufacture of war materiel. Because of its importance to the war effort, the United States federal government granted mill owner Arthur Wood special dispensation to violate environmental and labor laws. Laborers were worked into exhaustion and illness as the mill belched smoke into the sky and dumped waste directly into Grafton Lake. One of these exhausted workers, Billy Angler, fell directly into a vat of molten steel and was killed almost immediately. His brother Darius had been a chemist and the employee of Grafton Steel until he left his position when he felt the working conditions were becoming unsafe. With his brother's death, Darius began to formulate his revenge against his former employer. Over the course of months, he formulated an additive that would force the shuttering of the mill by corrupting the very metal it was composed of. Supremely paranoid, Darius Angler moved multiple times while designing the additive, going so far as to shoot an innocent hiker that got too close to his cabin in the woods. One morning in the spring of 2077, he snuck into the mill and poured his completed additive into the blast furnace. The smokestacks soon began to spit white flecks of highly toxic soot into the air. An inspection concluded that fixing the problem would require the entire mill to be shut down while the affected equipment was replaced. If this wasn't done, the corruption would spread, the plant would continue to fill the air with toxic white soot, and the equipment would require near constant repairs to continue operation. Arthur Wood viewed the act of sabotage as an attack by the mill workers and refused to allow the mill to be shuttered even temporarily. The ash would be just reward for the attack on the mill. So the mill continued to blast out toxic soot, coating the entire valley, killing workers and their families over time. While Darius Angler caused the formation of the soot in the first place, it was Arthur Wood that allowed the soot to propagate across the region. While these two slowly destroyed the environment and killed or sickened hundreds to thousands in revenge, the next man on this list was much more direct in his revenge killing. That man, number two on this list, is David Thorpe, the warlord of the Raiders of the Savage Divide. Before the war, David Thorpe was a ruthless corporate raider and the employee of Arctos Pharma. In October 2077, he left his wife and kids at home and traveled to the Pleasant Valley Ski Resort with his mistress, Rosalind Jeffries. The two were enjoying a perfectly good weekend of drugs and adultery until it was ruined by nuclear war. In the aftermath of the bombs, the resort sent a group of envoys to Charleston seeking aid. With the city in chaos, the resort envoys were turned away with nothing. As I said when speaking of Morris Stevens, the resort goers then endured the nuclear winter of 2077 to 2078. When the people of Charleston sent a party into the mountains to attempt to help the resort goers in the summer of 2078, David Thorpe executed the envoys in cold blood. The vacationers now split into five raider gangs, and David Thorpe became the boss of the largest group, the Cutthroats. Over the next four years, they raided the survivors in the valleys below, stealing their food and supplies. On Christmas Eve 2082, David's girlfriend Rosalind Jeffries attempted to raid Charleston in the hopes of bringing David a gift. The raid went poorly and Rosalind was captured. Improperly informed that she had been killed, David Thorpe took a mini-nuke and raced to the dam over Charleston. 
In the early morning hours of Christmas Day 2082, he blew the dam, flooding the city, killing hundreds including Rosalyn, who was being interrogated in the Capitol Courthouse Jail. While David Thorpe was a clear and present danger to the people of Appalachia, there was a far more dangerous man hiding in the shadows. At number one on the list of the most evil people in Appalachia, we have Thomas Eckhart, the father of the Scorch Beasts. Before the war, Thomas Eckhart was publicly known as the United States Secretary of Agriculture, while in private, he was also a member of the shadowy military-industrial complex organization known as the Enclave. With nuclear war looming as a near certainty on the horizon, Secretary Eckhart worked to secure his position in the aftermath of the bombs. He chose the Enclave's bunker under the White Spring Resort to serve as his base of operations, and he used his power within the Department of Agriculture to build a state-of-the-art bioweapons lab there. He had previously used his position to fund multiple programs supposedly meant to help the American people, but that were really just fronts for clandestine enclave programs. On the day of the bombs, Secretary Eckhart was the highest ranking government official to arrive at the bunker, making him the new head of the White Spring Enclave. A rabid anti-communist, he intended to continue the war against the Chinese using Appalachia's automated missile silos. When a large portion of the enclave members of the bunker disagreed with that decision, he had those dissenters put to death. Now that he commanded a group faithful to his ideals, he began to attempt to resume the war on the Chinese. He learned that to launch the nukes he would need four things. A compliant general, a nuclear launch keycard, nuclear launch codes, and a DEFCON rating of one. He had a compliant general. He could get a nuclear launch keycard and the launch codes, but the DEFCON rating was going to be a problem. Unfortunately for Eckhart, the local silos ran off an automated system that prevented the launch of nukes if the situation didn't call for it. Ever since the end of the war, the DEFCON system had been ticking up. He decided he would have to trick the DEFCON system into thinking a launch was warranted. To this end, he had his right-hand man, Agent Gray, reactivate the production of Liberator robots at a local Chinese spy base. When this didn't do the trick, he reactivated the vats of FEV at West Tech Huntersville, leading to the spawning of a new group of super mutants. This too wasn't enough to give him the necessary DEFCON 1. The answer to his problem soon arrived from one of his science teams. At a lab hidden in an old mine, a bat had been accidentally contaminated with some unknown chemical. It grew to be enormous and spread a strange taint to its vicinity that corrupted the environment around it. While the team that had created the monstrous bat wanted to euthanize it, Secretary Eckhart told him to make more instead. When he wasn't working on attempting to restart the nuclear war, Secretary Eckhart was ordering the kidnapping of Wastelanders to use as test subjects in his mutation serums program. In order to increase his standing within the White Spring and potentially with the American people, he ordered the organization of a special election of those within the bunker that named him President of the United States. When his super mutants were wiped out by the surviving post-war societies outside the bunker in the summer of 2086, Eckhart ordered the release of the monstrous bats to reach DEFCON 1 once and for all. While they did, in fact, yield the DEFCON level he was looking for, this act was too much for many within the Enclave, and President Eckhart was killed in a coup not long after this. The damage was done, though, and over the next 16 years, his giant bats, named Scorched Beasts by those that fought them, would be responsible for the destruction of the post-war order in Appalachia. The former dwellers of Vault 76 would end up having to use the nuclear launches he made possible on American soil so that the beasts he released wouldn't end the world. Before closing things out, I've got three dishonorable mentions here, which I'll start with Dr. Elias Khan, the head of FEV research at West Tech Huntersville. In this position, Dr. Khan was behind the creation of the Snallygaster and the Grafton Monster. Along with this, he was in charge during the poisoning of Huntersville with FEV. While I don't think we can blame him for the concept of dosing the entire town with FEV, he administered the facility as they did. Next we have Governor Evans, the last governor of West Virginia. Before the bombs, he sanctioned the continued operation of Grafton Steel even after the soot started to poison the valley, and supported the mill's efforts in removing protesters from the premises with the National Guard. He appears to have been the target of a corruption investigation and was likely in the pocket of local business. Lastly, he abandoned his post when the bombs came down, leaving the state government paralyzed with indecision at a critical time. Last, we have Scott Turner, the man who destroyed Watoga in an attempt to control it. Scott Turner worked at the Robco Research Center near Watoga, Atomic Mining Services' city of the future. Scott couldn't get a spot in the city itself, leaving him to live in a trailer in the bog town. In revenge against the country club style admissions process, he programmed a virus that was intended to have the robots 
peacefully evict the citizens of Otoga, leaving him in charge. Instead, the robots violently assaulted the citizens and left the city uninhabitable one day before the bombs came down. Watoga could have been the center of a technologically advanced civilization in the aftermath of the bombs. Instead, it created a refugee crisis hours before the world ended. All right, I think that'll do it for my list of the 10 most evil people in Appalachia. If you're interested in learning more about these individuals, I have far more extensive lore videos covering most of them. Not all of these are as obviously named as my video covering Dr. Blackburn, but it should be fairly obvious that the White Spring Enclave video covers Secretary Eckhart in greater detail. If you want to receive notifications when I launch lore videos and videos like these, you can follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Jill AWS, Dark Malcontent of Metaverse Studios, Brian, Real76, Dr. Orion, and Samsung Smartfridge for their support. This has been the Resolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.